it's such a delight to be here with you all. You know, even even in the virtual realm, part of the benefit of coming together to these elongated practice sessions uh, so that we can hear about and contemplate and absorb, chew on some of the themes that underlie the experiential piece of, of practice life. So the philosophical and the psychological underpinnings that support the personal endeavor of waking up. And I call it, I have a, a term I love so much, I call it the practice field. The practice field, meaning really this this, mm, this force field of intentionality where we join as Sangha with the intention of really top rooting our extensive, extensively broad bandwidth of the human drama, right? The experience that we're all within together. And, and so in the practice field, we want to include a wider array of features onto the path of awareness that we call our meditation time. And we can, I've gotten good at it. We've all got, we've all got some ways that we're good at ignoring and avoiding uh, looking at a lot of the elements within our nature and that that can really slow down the process of, of evolution of waking up or it can even, you know, hijack our potential. We've gotten quite good at, at ignoring what some people call the, the shadow work, the parts we'd prefer not to have within the psyche that do contribute, that do inform the richness of, of the practice field. And so it seems from my personal experience and in working with many on the path, it seems that there's a breathtaking array of, of ways in which we contribute to the, to the suffering that we experience. Ways that we really, mm, engage with the struggle and in whatever way we can really the endeavor in the practice field is to bring kindness and insight to how we're responsible for our dukkha for our suffering for how we're responsible if not to blame at least responsible for and there's a distinction in the mood tone of, of those two words, right? To blame, to blame is to assume that we're, we're consciously creating harm. But to be responsible for what we're bringing in to our moments, for how we're meeting our moments, instead of being oriented towards what can we get from each other and, and from our experience. That's an orientation. That's an orientation that we can train ourselves. We can remind ourselves to live from. And then to teach those around us, young ones in particular, this is what it means to be fully human. There's an intrinsic level of responsibility there. You know, the, the Buddha was quite the prolific speaker. And it said, and you can fact check me on this, but it said that he used one word in his sermons more than any other word. And that word was bhavana cultivation 
cultivation. It's, it's, you know, leaving, leaving the mind alone and just taking care of the body is not enough. We know this because the mind is so easily overwhelmed with uncertainty. And, and that's what we're constantly in the face of, you know? And so to try to control circumstance, to try to control circumstance to be certain that we'll feel okay is a ridiculous endeavor that we're we're all we're all to some degree stuck in. So to relax into being all the colors and the mood tones and the emotional landscape of of what we bring into the practice field and to relax into that to turn towards that that's what the ancients suggested as the reason to take up any kind of wisdom tradition right to to relax into being with whatever we're we're asked to meet and in order to do that that would mean that we would have some innate contact with basic goodness innate contact with basic goodness we we come in to this earth realm with a feeling an embedded assumption of of being trusting that there's this empathic holding environment we assume we're bathed in and when we look at the innocence of infants, I'm I'm a new mother. I'm a one year old mother, so I can speak um, directly from this experience in the last year of of bringing this soul in, and how much wonder and how much curiosity and trust he has for the world, for his environments, for the people that are coming in and out of his field. When we, we look at the innocence of infants, we can sense that, that beauty, that nature of, of the bodhicitta, that, that basic inherent ease, that baseline of trust and tranquility. So babies are like really a touchstone, I feel, for that, that contact pulse. I call it baby therapy. Like if you can be with a young one as as close as they are to the portal into the world as possible, because they're that that pulse, that direct contact with the the benevolent, golden, vital life force, the bodhicitta. And we can sense that, we can touch it, we can glimpse that in the practice field, particularly in sangha, in these elongated practice sessions together. We can sense that ground of being, if even for a moment. And hopefully, if we've practiced for long enough, we can also sense the the bittersweet loss of that, the distance from that, that departure from our innocence, from our purity. And so in a sense, Meditation time becomes a field where we we just keep returning. We just keep coming back and and attempting and yearning and endeavoring to to get closer to that that ground of being that that inner home, that ease. I'm a somatic therapist and internal family systems therapist in IFS. We call it self with a capital S. I'm also a yoga teacher in in yoga. We call it mm, authentic nature. Buddhism, bodhicitta, perhaps. And so this way of internally resting gives us resting with our goodness 
irrespective of what we've brought into the practice field, resting with our goodness. It, it gives us the inner resource to stay open in what constantly feels like threatening, mysterious, uncontrollable change. I have a friend, dear, dear family friends who live in Asheville and they've got a two-year-old son. Their, their house was by the river, which grew 10 times the size, 10 times the size that the river normally was. And, and the father shared recently um, through social media, just the, the moments of, of them getting the news about this well, the hurricane coming in and 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 just a, a short amount of time to pack a bag, right? We've all gone through that meditation. What what would we bring? And so they packed a backpack of things they would need for a few nights. They put their little boy on top of the backpack and they hiked out through the through the river as it was rising. And um I just saw a stunning image of this little boy on the backpack you know, riding away from his home, which they would never be able to return to and got swept up. The look in his eyes in the photo I saw was of sheer wonder and deep curiosity. Almost a comfortability, comfortability in uncertainty and that's the practice, right? To, to have some sense of interest, some willingness to forge forward along the path, even as it's swelling up and ripping your home out from underneath you to, to, to gaze ahead with, with the shininess in the eyes, like a, like a young one with what's next. So the disturbance of this way of resting in wonder, that's what we call suffering, right? And, and to study, to study the ways that we suffer explicitly is in service to, to capacitate ourselves and, and not spin off and, and add more through the ways that we're misperceiving our experience. Yeah, you know, my son, and just to continue this, <laughs> this theme of, of the inner child, my son and, and any baby needs someone else to be the external operating center for caretaking, right? And so as young ones, we assume it's so. We assume that we're going to be cared for, that we're going to be held. Even though many of us growing up endured environments that, that didn't offer the conditions for us to stay continually trusting, to feel fully seen and and unconditionally held, right? Even if we grew up in, in the most benevolent of homes, there are aspects of our caretakers' psyches that were unconscious and that reflected back to us that we're not in a safe world. So we survive. We survive and we adopt. We are the most resilient species. And so very psychologically savvy. So we adopt ways of operating so we can get by. In IFS, we talk about it as our protectors. I love Hema Chodro and she talks about it as the armoring, the armoring around the heart, right? Ways that we get more rigid to get by to protect our vulnerabilities, that basic goodness that really is this, this family heirloom we're born in with. 
But getting by as an adult, I'm assuming for all of us, because we're here in the practice field together, it's it's what we don't want to accept as our lot in life, right? You know, in some way, that kind of dissatisfaction with with what we've accumulated this far is beneficial in order to to truly take up that that responsibility of mind training in order to incite the willingness that will be required to reopen the heart to be hurt again to be wounded to be vulnerable to include hurt right it's suffering through awakening it hurt is our pain is fuel for the path it motivates us to become more connected right that age old precept suffering is when we're closest to god It really helps us if we've got the the resources, if we have the mm, availability of touching in with the Dharma, it, it supports us to develop the internal operating center that knows about our Buddha nature, our basic goodness. So this this baseline of kindness. Gentle tolerance for ourselves and our vulnerabilities and our wounds and our weaknesses and the parts that we'd rather not have as part of the psyche, right? The whole colorful array of the human tapestry, the human drama, I call it the the buffet of beingness. Like we get the beautiful and the bitter. One part in particular I find is common for many of us, particularly in the West, is the self-critic. The self-critic. Now that that's in expression. And I know you all know what I'm talking about when I when I use that term, the self-critic. That's an expression that keeps people from knowing our innermost wounds and our vulnerability. And we need to encounter the self-critic. Often meditation time becomes the, uh, the place that we orient to our dysfunctional, dis- disturbing parts. And we need to count, encounter the self-critic. We'll have to bypass this gatekeeper at some point to get back to that level of of universal connectedness. It said uh, to encounter the personal, we'll have to encounter the personal in order to relate to what's transpersonal. And not just for a few people's jewel, not, not that the transpersonal potentiality of awakening is reserved for just some. That's why I love this path so much. It's a radical inclusivity. It's available to all of us. And so this encountering of our own material, the self-critic, the way in which we, we beat ourselves up, we harden, we get rigid, we get smaller, we feel inferior, inadequate. To encounter that first, the personal material, what heavies us, what burdens us, and then find or refind rather that that subterranean, right? The the energetic charge of the body mind continuum. That that basic space we're born in with. I guess the closest English word, and I'm huge on language, so 
the closest English word to, to umbrella this is, is connectedness, perhaps connectedness, which will need to hear lifelong that our inherent connectedness is not stained by anything we've done or haven't done. That's a radical statement because a lot of the human family have done some, some wretched things. And still, still at the core, and it's harder to get close to this truth in election season, I think, but still at the core is basic goodness. At the surface, perhaps a lot of distortion and dysfunction for some, but all of us are born in with, with Buddha, Buddha nature. In Sanskrit, the word is smriti, which means to return or rather to not forget. I feel like this path is the antidote to the human psyche's tendency for, for spiritual amnesia. Like we remember our connectedness and then we forget. And then we remember again and then we forget. And often the self-critic gets in the way of, of remembering. So again, while a child needs an external operating center to be reminded that internally they're safe, that internally their, their nature is good. As adults, we'll need to take the journey inward, the smriti return to find, to refind, to remember, to remember. Right? The, the Tibetan Book of the Dead has this line I love, oh, nobly born, Oh, you who are the sons and the daughters of the awakened ones, remember who you really are. So this, this transition from needing to needing all of this to be modeled and cultivated on the outside into opening up the, the inner access channels for it to be carried in the bones, in the bone marrow, on the inside, this knowing. That's, that's the passage of awakening. To become an adult who enters the world of mystery, right? Knee deep in the river swell, guaranteed pain and suffering ahead, guaranteed, and to remain curious. I love Zen practice because it's a traditional doorway into this reminder of staying curious. We come in, we, we humbly ask for receiving of the teachings that the, the ancients kept alive, in order that we might thrive and, and live from our greater potential. We, we don't just come in and, and follow a process and, and wait for the bell to ring, right? There's a cognition of the responsibility necessary here to, to absorb the teachings, to, to hear them, yes, but also to fumble with them, also to fail. And to come back, to listen again, to ask questions, to engage, to keep coming back to the cushion. This is smriti. This is the return. This is, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. And rather than trying to control who we are <laughs> so that we might become more of our spiritual ideal, right? The wounds that we carry are our idiosyncrasies. It is the material. 
of our evolution. It is the way through for each of us. The ways we feel inadequate or insecure, inappropriate, those parts will need a lot of tender care. If um, if the path of awakening is about, you know, spiritually waking up, then the path of healing our traumas and our, our wounds is about psychologically growing up. So we become our own caretakers. And so compassion is essential. We need, we become our own mothers, really. We need to taproot that quintessential maternal empathy, which wasn't always modeled or given to us, particularly in relation to trauma in times when we needed it most. So as adults, we now give that to ourselves. That's the work. And neuroscientists, this is so cool, neuroscientists have found that the same place in the brain gets activated if we're, if someone is being kind to us or if we're being kind to ourselves, whether we're being given care and compassion and understanding from someone else or from our internal operating center, we don't internally distinguish. That's really good news. (laughs) So the road in, it can be taken from this this committed level of, of taking responsibility for emerging out of the the misery and the the malevolence really that, that we harm ourselves with. We are born in very trusting. We're born in trusting and we take up, we adopt an attitude of fear to protect ourselves. Especially when we recognize how incredibly fragile we are on a psychological level, spiritually very strong, psychologically very fragile beings. And we can't jump over this vulnerability on our pursuit of of spiritual strength because then our emotions get suppressed. We become less authentic. It's like a, a repressive, narrowed energy. And really more importantly, we become less empathetic less compassionate because we don't want to see others revealing their vulnerability. And so in order to have some solidarity with our human family, with the Sangha, we'll have to touch our humanness and release the fixation that we're going to have to be someone other than our history in order to be liberated. So meditation, just as I'm moving towards closure here on this on this share, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you all. The The practice field is about meeting our self with the capital S and all of the parts that inform who we are, our history included. So we can heal wounds of our past and and wake up to be more functional to whatever we'll be asked to need in our future. We're not sure what that is yet. So this practice is a a pause from the momentum of our karmic life so that we can capacitate ourselves to integrate what's already happened 
and align ourselves with, with spaciousness so we can meet what's going to happen. In that way, coming back, that smriti, that trust, that, that remembering who we really are, not despite, but because of what we've endured, gives rise, gives rise to bodhicitta, opens the heart. In the chakra system, we call the heart anahata. Anahata chakra is the unstruck cord, meaning unshakable cannot be messed with, cannot be stained. No matter what's occurred, no matter what decisions we've made. Genuine, empathic, open-heartedness. If we spend enough time here in the practice field together with some willingness to turn towards all the colors of who we really are and what we're bringing, that empathic open-heartedness becomes not just something we're cultivating, but an organic expression of who we really are. So may we all find glimpses of that tonight and onwards. And when we forget, uh, we know we know where to return to to get a little dose of oh yeah this is here too thank you all so much for your attention and your intention and such an honor such an honor and a privilege to be with you all and i'm also just thanking the gods that um my baby didn't cry in the background because i Know that you would have heard him if he did. And it's been pretty calm over here. <laughs> so thanks for sticking with me. Lovely to be with you all tonight.